All right, well, we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's cybersecurity webinar. I'm Associate Professor John Williams. I'm the Deputy Director of the Cybersecurity Initiative here at the University of Queensland, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator and MC for this evening's event. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and made available afterwards, and we'll also be using the Zoom Q&A function. It's a little button down in the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, we will attempt to get to your questions, but we do apologize in advance if we, if we run out of time and, and don't get to them. So to get us started, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Gallagher. She's the Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Engagement and Entrepreneurship here at the University of Queensland to give the welcome address. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you so much, John, and welcome everybody. Great to um, have you here with us this afternoon, this evening, or in the morning, whatever time zone you're in, uh, to, to participate in this webinar. As John has indicated, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Engagement and Entrepreneurship at the University of Queensland. Even though we are all zooming in from different locations, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands where UQ stands. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within our community and their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'd also like to acknowledge our UQ colleagues, students, panellists, and the many attendees who are joining us from around the world. It's a great pleasure to provide a short opening address at today's cybersecurity webinar. We're excited to have this opportunity to collaborate with the Embassy of Israel in Australia and Tel Aviv University to host this public webinar between our institutions with an aim of deepening our understanding of cybersecurity. It's pleasing to see that uh, we had more than 200 attendees register to join us uh, from all around the world. So uh, again, a big good morning and good evening to you all. I'm sure that you will agree that today we can expect a robust discussion from our keynote and panelists. The breadth and depth of their experience is impressive. And we're especially fortunate to have a panel of global experts on these issues. So why is the future of cybersecurity important? The cybersecurity industry is rapidly growing every day. Even with the increased attention on protecting electronic information, there is ample reason for businesses, organizations, and the public to be concerned. Malicious cyber activity against Australian national and economic interests has increased in recent years in terms of its frequency, scale, and sophistication. Cyber security ventures expects global cyber crime costs to grow by more than 15% per year over the next five years, reaching more than 10.5 trillion US dollars annually by 2025, up from 3 trillion US dollars in 2015. They predict there will be a ransomware attack on businesses every 11 seconds from 2021, up from 41 seconds in 2016. Alarmingly, more than half of all cyber attacks are committed against small to mid-sized businesses, and 60% of them go out of business within six months of falling victim to a data breach or hack. Cybersecurity is now a global priority as cybercrime and digital threats grow in frequency and complexity. As a global university, our mission at the University of Queensland is to address global cybersecurity challenges and educate top cybersecurity leaders. We are the first organization in Australia to adopt the internationally recognized cybersecurity education framework, which is the current gold star standard around the world for cybersecurity education and job alignment. It is estimated that Australia will need an additional 18,000 cybersecurity professionals by 2026. UQ has partnered with industry experts to develop the most comprehensive Master of Cybersecurity program in Australia to genuinely address the interdisciplinary nature of this field while meeting the need for deep technical specialization in core areas. These specializations include cyber defense, cyber criminology, cryptogra cryptogra <laughs> cryptography and leadership streams allowing students to play to their strengths and forge a path in this growing global industry. In November 2020, UQ established an Industry 4.0 Energy Test Lab in partnership with Siemens and with funding support from the Australian government. 
The Cybersecurity Energy Test Lab team facilitates research and education in critical infrastructure resilience and cybersecurity. At UQ, we're fortunate to have a team dedicated to enhancing cybersecurity initiatives, and our newly launched cybersecurity strategy reflects the constantly evolving cybersecurity threat landscape and the diverse needs of the university and our community. We hope that today's webinar will serve as an opportunity to hear firsthand about UQ's future trends, perceived threats and emerging technology, as well as the evolving global landscape. Thank you again for joining me and my thanks to um, all of the speakers um, on the panel this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jessica. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Heron Elazari. Heron is a globally recognized security researcher, author, and strategic analyst. Her independent research work and writing about emerging security issues has been featured by TED, Scientific American, Wired, The Financial Times, and me. She holds an MA in security studies from Tel Aviv University, where she is now a senior researcher at the Blavatnik Interdisciplinary Cyber, Re Cyber Research Center, focusing on the complex relationships between hackers, industry, and government. She's also a guest faculty member at Singularity University in California. In 2014, Karen became the first Israeli woman to speak at the annual TED conference. Her TED talk about the role of hackers has been viewed by millions, translated into 30 languages and selected for TED's list of most powerful ideas. Karen is also the founder of Israel's largest hacker community event, B-Sides Tel Aviv, and the founder of Leading Cyber Ladies Network and the co-author of the Women in Tech book, an Amazon bestseller. Thanks very much for joining us, Karen, over to you. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, Jessica. It's my pleasure to join you today, everyone, from sunny Tel Aviv. So good morning from Tel Aviv, good evening in Australia, and good day wherever you are in the world. I'd like to share with you today my point of view, my perspective about our possibility for a secure future. And to do that, I'm going to take a look at what our future, the cybersecurity future looks like, but we're going to take a look at that possibility for a secure future from the perspective that I have held throughout my career in the cybersecurity space for more than 20 years. And that is the hacker's perspective. The hacker point of view is how I grew up in this industry. Here in Tel Aviv, I was a very curious little child and growing up, I had a lot of questions. My curiosity was my main driver. In fact, if you ask my mom, who might be on today's webinar, she will tell you that instead of a bedtime story, I got volumes of the encyclopedia to read before sleep. So I was a very curious little girl. And when we first got access to the internet here in Israel in the early 90s, I realized that through the internet, through the World Wide Web, I could find answers to all of my questions. If only I could teach myself how the internet worked. And sometimes I had to also teach myself how to get into password protected websites or sometimes other people's computers, because that's where the information that I was curious about, that's where it was. I hadn't realized that my activities were actually called being a hacker. Not until I met my hacker mentor, her name, Angelina Jolie. In 95, she portrayed a fierce high school hacker in the Hollywood movie Hackers, and that film instantly captured my heart and my mind because it represented a view of kids, really high school kids, who are passionate about the same things as I was, and they used their capabilities, they used their hacking skills in that movie to ultimately save the day. For those of you who have not seen, the, seen this film yet, I rec absolutely recommend it, 25 years and it's still a classic. To me, that movie showcased what hackers can look like and seeing a young girl represented in that film, a young woman, was absolutely instrumental in my choice to pursue this as a life and as a career. And this is exactly what I've dedicated my life to since I saw that film, the study of what hackers can show us, how hackers uncover the true realities of our digital world. These are just some of the organizations I've worked with in the past 25 years. As you've heard, I'm a researcher here at Tel Aviv at the ICRC Blavatnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Center. I'm also a guest faculty member with other organizations around the world. 
And I've, of course, spent some time working with the Israeli military, as most young women and men do at the age of 18 right here in Israel. I'm also the founder of two nonprofit initiatives that started here in Israel but are now making impact worldwide. The first is B-Sites Tel Aviv, which is Israel's largest hacker and security research community conference hosted by Tel Aviv University. And our call for papers right now is open for our 2021 summer event. So you can actually suggest one of your topics, one of your uh, maybe research projects to share with us in Tel Aviv, and we would really welcome you. The second nonprofit is the Leading Cyber Ladies, which was started here in Israel as a platform for women in cybersecurity to connect, and in the past two years has grown into a global community with thousands of members from Israel, Europe, North America, and hopefully soon, Australia and the Pacific region. In 2014, I received a prestigious once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to share my point of view about hackers on the international TED stage. And I claimed that in some cases, hackers can actually act as the immune system for our digital age because they show us what is possible. They uncover vulnerabilities and even the malicious hackers force us to evolve. I also focused in my talk about the role of friendly hackers, which is something I'd like to explore in this keynote today. But it's not just about what hackers do. It's up to all of us. Today, I think it's time to adopt the mindset of a digital immune system. And it's absolutely necessary. As the world encountered and evolved to you know, come to bear, to come to grips with COVID-19, we also had a lot of changes in the digital realm. And I think now is a great opportunity to have that chance for a mindset to adopt our immune system in public health thinking that we've really you know, been practicing in the past year, we can bring that mindset to the digital realm. And I can guarantee you, this is what criminals have been doing. So let's talk a little bit about how COVID-19 changed the landscape for cyber criminals. When we all started hearing about COVID-19 about a year ago, it was a hot topic and people would flock to websites, applications, and maybe newsletters that featured information about this new pandemic, what it was doing around the world, how things were progressing. So criminals used these keywords to get on people's computers, whether with malicious applications or in other tools like emails that would get your attention and that you would click on. But as the pandemic progressed, we all slowly got a little bit desensitized to many of these terms. So criminals latched onto the new terms that now people would care the most about. Financial terms, things about taking a medical leave of absence from your job, or maybe a payment application or a, a beneficial aid application, a relief grant that you signed up for. These are things that people would absolutely interact with if they got into their inbox. And this is exactly what criminals took advantage of. Here's an email from the United States that was using a legitimate email by the United States Department of Labor, copying the exact email word for word verbatim, just adding in the additional attachment, a Word document, which would actually be the first stage loader for an ongoing TrickBot infection. TrickBot is a specific type of malware. It's used in banking trojans. It's used in other types of criminal operations. And it's doing very well because it uses a variety of tricks to get on people's computers. Now, this is what happened in the US. In the UK, criminals adopted to the government offering relief grants for small and medium businesses. So they set up their own uh, application, if you will. They created malicious PDF files that would masquerade as the legitimate relief grant applications. Furthermore, incentivizing people to submit their details or the document might expire in a few days. So using that element of time. Now, what we're seeing here is just one form of malicious innovation. Cyber criminals react to whatever is happening. But innovation is not just about uh, the types of technology that they use, the malware that they use, or how they latch onto popular terms. Sometimes the innovation is also about the business model for the criminal operation or their approach, how to find their targets, how to find their victims. And the next story I'm about to share with you is really a fantastic example of how bold the criminals have been in the past year. So this is the Tesla Gigafactory in Reno, Nevada in the United States. It's a factory where Tesla makes a lot of important components as part of its production line, including their batteries. Now, 
Last year, during the summer of COVID-19, the height of lockdowns and restrictions, a criminal traveled from Russia to Nevada to meet with an employee working at that factory. And they took that employee out on a scenic trip, a tour to Lake Tahoe, where they popped the question, not will you marry me, but rather will you accept $1 million in exchange for introducing malware into the Tesla network? knowingly introducing malware. So they weren't tricked, they were offered money. And this was extremely bold from the criminal's point of view. I think you would agree, going directly to an employee and offering them a cash payment of a million dollars. Thankfully for Tesla, the employee didn't agree. What they did is actually report this to the FBI and they together with the FBI created a sting operation to gather more information about that criminal's operation and to ultimately arrest them. And what was discovered from the indictment documents and yes, I know many of you don't read cyber criminal uh, indictment charges, but this is something that I do because it teaches us a great deal about criminal operations and the law enforcement agencies that release these do a great job of really tracking down the different modus operandi of criminal groups. We can learn from this indictment, for example, that the same criminal was allegedly part of a group that got away with a $5 million ransom from a major company called CWT. You might have heard about Carson Wagonet Travel. If not, they're a major travel technology software company. And when they got to hit with the ransom, we also got our very first glimpse to another innovation from the criminal point of view. So the criminals did not just infect that company with ransomware, malware that will encrypt their files and then require a payment in ransom, usually bitcoins, in order to release the access to the files which is you know, almost a perfect crime because they don't have to steal anything. All they do is disrupt the organization's access to their own data. But they added another layer of sophistication. They created a chat forum where they were chatting with their targets, their victims, which they called their clients. And here you can see the actual chat conversation. The person from CWT is reaching out to the criminals asking for a very special price because they responded within two days as the criminals instructed them. They're asking for a discount. They don't wanna pay $10 million in ransom. And the criminals respond. Mind you, the criminals are calling themselves support in this conversation, which is extremely, extremely bold and cheeky. And they're explaining to their victims, yes, well, this isn't a special price. You will get a discount because you did respond quickly. However, this is a standard amount for a company of your size, and it's probably much cheaper than lawsuits, expenses, reputation loss, and leakage. So what we're seeing here is criminals are using a second element to the attack. It's not just about ransomware, it's also about extortion. They're basically threatening to leak the company's private files, IP, and valuable information in order to incentivize the victims to pay. This innovation was born back in 2019 by a group called Maze, which launched some very successful ransomware campaigns. And the reason for it is that they realized a lot of companies are getting more prepared for ransomware attacks, so they have a lot of backups in place. And those companies are now capable of reverting to the pre-ransom situation. However, the criminals still want to make their payday. So what they're doing is stealing some choice files, some intellectual property, some sensitive files, and then threatening to leak these to the public as incentive for their victims to pay. The first target of such an attack was back in 2019. It was an American company called Allied Universal. And in order to prove they were serious, Mays actually leaked this snippet of you know, sensitive internal files to a tech journalist to show that they are real. Afterwards, they created a website where they actually feature the leaks from companies that wouldn't collaborate with them, wouldn't pay the ransom. As they say, these are companies that do not wish to cooperate with us. So they are shaming their victims. And some of these victims are very well-known companies, very well-known brands. I'm sure you've heard about some of these brands. But of course, there is an interesting twist in the plot. Just a couple um, weeks ago, actually a couple months ago at this time in early November, Mays started getting so much attention, the criminals were, weren't comfortable anymore. So they put out this press release on November 1st saying they're shutting down the project. They're not gonna continue doing it. They've had enough. They are not gonna collaborate with other criminal groups. And mind you, these are criminal groups that have websites, official press releases, brands, logos. They are acting like a business. And 
you guessed it, even when they announced that they're going to shut down, that's never the end of the story. Because with this particular group, just a few weeks after the allegedly shut down, a new piece of ransomware started making the rounds and becoming just as successful as Maze. But this time it had a different name, a different brand. It's called Egregor Ross. And it's not just a Russian sounding name. Egregor is the malware name. Ross actually stands for ransom as a service. So they're basically infecting organizations and then selling off that access to other criminal groups to organize the ransom operation. So the criminals have really evolved in the stretch of less than a year. They came up with a new business model. They made a lot of money. They went bold and sent people to offer cash money to willing accomplices within organizations. And then they rebranded and created a new business model where they're the platform and they're actually enabling other criminal groups to run additional criminal operations all within the scope of a year. Just imagine how many you know, different innovations and business models a regular company goes through within much longer periods of time. So what this, these stories I hope help to illustrate is that while for many organizations, COVID-19 has been about adapting to a new reality, coping, changing our business models in order to survive, for criminals, it's been an opportunity to thrive. It's been a renaissance, one could say. Some people have even called it a COVID-19 renaissance. Now, at the same time, our digital lives have also changed. We've introduced more technology into our lives than ever before because we rely on technology like we're doing just today to communicate and stay safe during COVID-19. So this has actually created what I like to call an expanding digital universe of opportunities for bad guys. And we could you know, talk a lot about how many different uh, devices and tools and gadgets are out there, but you know, I could show you statistics and tell you the numbers, but let me just ask you this. With a hand on your heart, who do you have surrounding you right now where you're joining us from? Do you have more family members and pets or digital devices? I can tell you that I've got dozens of digital devices just where I'm at. And I think this is the reality for many of us. Home is not just the new office these days. It's also the space where we consume education, entertainment. It's where we live and where we do everything online. And of course, digital collaboration tools like Zoom, for example, which we're using today, have also become a target for criminals. And specifically, Zoom credentials have even become popular targets for criminals. So what we're really seeing is that our new reality has created vast opportunities for bad guys to explore. Now, what should we be doing in this new reality? Well, I've got a few ideas, and I want to start with one major idea. I think it's great, it's a great time to focus on something I like to call cyber hygiene in this new context of COVID-19. Usually when we hear about cyber hygiene, we talk about updating our operating system or uh, maybe not downloading malicious apps or clicking on links. And these are fantastic advices. But there's also other elements to cyber hygiene. For example, sharing our computer access and our digital services with other people or recycling our passwords. You wouldn't recycle your COVID-19 mask, would you? You wouldn't give it to somebody else to use after you've used it. So why are we doing the same things with our digital services, thereby creating further opportunities for bad guys to infect us? Let's bring some of the hygiene models that we've adapted so strongly in the past year, like you know, washing our hands, maintaining social distancing, and keeping masks to ourselves. Let's bring some of these concepts into the digital world. Now, I've got many more ideas to share with you. I just want to finish with one final note that I want to maybe further explore in our discussion. The concept of a digital immune system requires all of us to build up our herd immunity, to make lives harder for the bad guys. And there's one element I'm very passionate about, which is that hackers can actually help. And very briefly, I'd like to share with you that in the past five years, I've dedicated a lot of my time and my attention right here at Tel Aviv University to the study of a phenomena called bug bounty program, which is actually a way for major organizations as big as some of the biggest brands you might have heard of to actively work with and collaborate with friendly hackers from all over the world. Now, these friendly hackers really represent a diverse 
you know, a diverse background. They come from all walks of life, all backgrounds. This is specifically a map from the Google Bug Bounty Program, and it's from 2016. Now, you'll notice there are not a lot of dots in Australia, but the reality today is that there are many security researchers in Australia contributing in bug bounty programs. And I just want to highlight one program, uh, a company called Bug Crowd, which was actually founded by an Australian, Casey Ellis, which is actually a platform that connects these individual friendly hackers with big businesses. And according to Bug Crowd, in 2020, during the pandemic, there's actually been more friendly hackers contributing their findings, identifying high criticality, high severity vulnerabilities than ever before. So actually being locked down at home actually contributed to more hackers helping everybody stay safer. My point of view is that everybody can be a hacker hero. And this is why I'm extremely hopeful that we have education programs like your university's education program and like the ones that we have in Tel Aviv University. Many workforce reports tell us that we need millions of security professionals to join up in this industry. It needs all the help it can get. Some of them are gonna come from academic programs. Some of them I believe are also gonna come from the friendly hacker community, which I get together with each year at DEF CON, the world's largest hacking convention. The truth is when I go to hacking conventions, I don't see criminals. I see the talent and possibilities of our future. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be really, really interested to discuss with you, to hear your questions and to really see what you have in mind and talk to the other panelists. Thank you so much for your time. And wherever you are in the world, I hope you stay safe. John, back to you. Thanks very much, Karen, for that. Um, lots to think about there, and I look forward to um, to getting back to some of those themes in the in the Q and A. Um, first of all, I'll just let the audience know that the um, the Q and A option at the bottom of your Zoom window is open, so you can post questions, and and we'll um, we'll pass them off to panelists as as we can. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce the rest of our panel. If I could ask um, Paul and Rob to turn on their cameras, there they are. Uh, so Paul Toomey is the CEO of Biosecurity Systems, an infection minimization solutions company. He founded Argo Pacific, a cybersecurity consulting firm for governments and Fortune 500s worldwide. And he co-founded Stash, a data-centric security company. He also served as president and CEO of ICANN for six years. And then we have Robert Champion, Robert has 30 years experience in the Queensland Government Information and Communications Technology um, Office and is the Queensland Government Chief Information Security Officer, where he oversees the development and implementation of information security across a wide range of state government portfolios. Thanks, Paul and Rob, both for joining us this evening. Thank you. So, um, look, what I'd like to do, I'd like to throw a question to you, Paul, um, just to get things started. So in, in your roles, and you've got a really broad, really diverse, impressive career, you've had exposure to cybersecurity in, in what I might consider the broadest global sense at a, at a governance level, at an institutional level, as well as down in the nuts and bolts. Um, so, uh, you know, perhaps reflecting on what, what Karen has just said, what's, what's your take on the emerging threats and our readiness to combat them? I, I think Karen put forward a, a model around public health that um, I've been spent the last, a lot of the last 10 years that it would have been trying to promote as well, which I'm sort of, I'm sort of wondering actually will succeed or not, frankly. Um, let me, let me explain that as, as we can start a discussion on it. Um, uh, I chair an organization called Cyber Green that every week uh, uh, scans uh, the entire internet and basically records inside ASNs, inside networks where there's poorly configured um the protocols for the use of networking equipment um and uh produces huge amounts of data you know which we could then use public public uh for public response um similarly um i expect the sort of the bug crowd type people are sort of doing trying to find stuff for a public benefit the difficulty is trying to think through are we in a are we in an area where we can actually take a common good approach to cybersecurity? Or are we in an arms race? And 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 which one of these things are we in? Um, I know at Cyber Green we uh, do not go beyond a certain level in the way in which we actually look this stuff through because we start getting into the space where private companies do the same function for companies, and they operate like we're in the arms race. And I'm one of your weapon suppliers, if you like. Put it that way. I'm competing against the other side. 
we're trying to come down to a certain level saying, well, here's macro data and trying to get that out. Um, I'll be trying to get Karen's response to this. Uh, she, you know, she'll know from her military background and, and elsewhere that the sort of techniques you can find to do this probably good you know, hacking are the same things you're doing to find zero, zero days that you can use for other purposes. So how do we, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with this. I've spent 10 years of my, my time and effort on this question of can you have a public good, public health approach to cybersecurity? What are the limits of that? versus are we in a zero sum game, which is really an arms race? Uh, look, thanks, Paul. And actually there's some very, uh, Karen and I and the others had a bit of a chat the other night and we we're talking a bit about some of the economics of, of bug bounty. So hopefully we'll get a chance to go back there. Um, but look, thanks, thanks for that. Um, Rob, now to you, in your role as QGCIO, you're responsible for the cybersecurity of a tremendously diverse range of government, um, state government organisations. So within that context, what do you see as some of your major challenges? And also, do you see any other roles for the state government in, in the cybersecurity conversation more broadly? Yeah, definitely. I, I think there are a number of um, themes that, that I picked up on in Karen's discussion. That digital immunity piece is where we sort of talk about is around building resilience to the system. So the immunity is one of those first pieces. There's a whole bunch of preventative things that we can be doing, but very much that conversation around the economics, um, it's much more expensive to defend than it is to attack. Um, and I think one of our fundamental problems is our vendors quite often are incentivized in some of the wrong ways um, through the, the capital model that we use. We've got to actually put that change the economics of the cybersecurity arms race that Paul spoke about. Um, you know, it is, it is always going to be a challenge. We've got a greater attack surface than we've ever had. We've got a, um, a probably a diversity that is uh, growing day by day and our embracing digital technologies is really fundamental to the way government and business deliver services. So it, it has got to be fundamental to the organization that we take cybersecurity very seriously. Um, I think the main challenges that I see is around the skills and the engagement. Um, we've got a whole bunch of challenges with it being seen as just a technical area. Um, it's very much multidisciplinary. We need people who understand not just the technology risk, but also that business risk and translate that into the business um, of government and the business of corporations so that they really take it to heart, manage that risk. But as an ecosystem, we've, we've, we've got to find better ways to build that digital immunity and, and build our resilience to these types of threats. Thanks very much, Rob. Karen, I've, I've seen you nodding furiously at, at, at points there. I might give you an opportunity to respond to what you just heard from Paul and, uh, and Rob. Yeah, thank you so much, John. So I absolutely agree, Paul and, and Robert. There are a few great points that you brought up. From my perspective, what I really try to focus on with the immune system idea and with the public health efforts, yes, I think that governments and vendors and internet service providers can do a lot on their side, but it's also about individual choices. In the same way that the past year, COVID-19 forced us to make different types of choices in our lives, it's a lot about the choices people make each day. And to our audience today, the students, the representatives from business and public sector, you all make, and I make, hundreds of security decisions each day. When we click on links, when we install applications, when we update or do not update our software, when we buy a new gadget into our home and leave it with the default username and password. So, and certainly I mentioned the idea of, of passwords generally being one of the ways that criminals today are easily getting into organizations because so many people recycle their passwords. So when I focus on the public health, you know, point of view or the immunity point of view, whilst I don't necessarily have the government or the industry representation or perspectives that you bring, Paul and Robert, I want to focus on the law of big numbers. I want to focus on how we can get hundreds and thousands and millions of people to make different security choices. And with the friendly hackers, I can absolutely tell you that in the past five years, as I've researched this phenomena, it has had an impact 
on the big picture because it's impacted the amount of effort that a criminal organization has to go through in order to find new vulnerabilities. In the past, in our industry, it was well known to discuss the concept of a zero day vulnerability or a, you know, previously unknown vulnerability as something that's traded in the criminal underground markets at dozens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. In the past year, the cost to develop and acquire such a zero days has gone up because criminals have to invest more time, more effort, and they have to go through, you know, they have to really invest more into their operation. So those friendly hackers identifying a lot of the low hanging fruit, quote unquote, of easy to find vulnerabilities, they're helping everybody just raise that level of security. At least that's, of course, my point of view. I did want to ask a question, though, to Paul and to Robert. About 10 years ago, I remember that I was sitting, I was participating in a security panel in Singapore, and there was a gentleman from Australia who spoke about a project called the iCode project, which was uh, supposedly some sort of a pilot operation for internet service providers in Australia to together identify infected computers within their networks and then wall them off from the internet. Now, I don't have any information about how successful that pilot project was or not. Paul, maybe you, you've got some background with that or Robert, but that's something I was, you know, I was hopeful about when I heard about that initiative. I do think that gov state governments, local governments and ISPs are in a position to do a lot more to kind of clean up the internet as it were. Also by, you know, forcing a quarantine on an infected device or an infected network. This is very similar to what we're seeing with COVID-19. So that's my point of view. Let's take this moment in time and as an opportunity to bring in those public health models that we're using with COVID-19. Because cybersecurity is a major issue. It's, you know, it's impacting millions and millions around the world, just like COVID-19. Paul, did you want to respond to that? There's a mute button. Mute. There it is. Yeah, yeah, so the idea did come into effect. It first came in 2010. Um, uh, it, it, I, I had run the government agency that dealt with that 10 years prior to that and knew the discussion. Um, basically, that was a response from a threat from the government that it was going to essentially make them accountable for the breaches. So then they, it was a way of, you'll see there's a pattern of Australian government regulation, which is like threaten you with things and hope that you'll do a deal. We've just done that with Google and Facebook. Um, so there was, um, uh, it was the same thing. And there was, it was, a, it was a, a pressure brought to bear on the ISPs themselves to have their own, their own code. It was very unpopular with the Americans. They didn't like the idea that private sector could actually be censors. And they caused us a lot of grief in the background. Um, um, the status of it at the moment, I'm, I'm a bit out of date, frankly, maybe Robert, you might know better, I don't know, I, I, think, I don't quite know how it's actually evolved, um, so I'm sorry, we should follow up on that, but um, yes, it's a, it is a bit of a pattern here of, of, of trying to create these sort of industry codes by, by threatening to have regulation, it's an Australian, Australian uh, governance thing. Yeah, Paul, I, I recall that, that program um, that Karen spoke about, and, and Look, I think some of that has moved into the commercial, um, into the um, antivirus and, and the endpoint security companies, um, that threat sharing. So things like the Cyber Threat Alliance and a number of those other pieces of sort of um, the visibility that ISPs have is, is really key to how we respond to this and, and getting the response to the right place. The always, the challenge is gonna be how much does the government intervene in those scenarios and what are the what's the consequences of that intervention um, you know we've seen if we take the public health example um, the costs of things like hotel quarantine the the costs of border closure have societal wide costs that are borne by um, broadly across the society in a number of different places we've got to be able to map those things out and we don't necessarily always know what the impacts of these things are going to be so um, taking that approach where we either um, cut connectivity off from the internet to say your, your machine is no longer fit to be connected to a public system um, can have potential impacts on healthcare, it could have impacts on commerce, it could have impacts on 
education or other things. So understanding all of those is quite difficult. It's, uh, it's kind of like that old observation that the only secure computer is one that's switched off, unplugged and buried in cement. And, and that's, that's our challenge to find that, that, that balance between availability and, and security. Um, look, thanks for that, um, all, all three of you. That was really interesting. Look, we've got a couple of questions uh, from the audience. So I'll, I'll um, go to this one first from Michael. Uh, so Michael asks, how can new ventures or SMEs, small to medium enterprises, defend themselves against, and their IP or digital assets against being hacked or stolen with very little budget to, to focus on, on digital immunity or cybersecurity? And um, is there any role for the government to offer best practices and consistent packages or advice to those new startups? I'll leave it open, someone jump in. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll take that. I think there's, there's a number of things, um, particularly awareness. We, you know, if you look back in, if we take that public health example, um, in Australia, we had a very um, high profile campaign that was run in the, in the 80s um, around slip, slop, slap, which was uh, skin cancer. Um, there was life being it. I think we're in that sort of situation where the public awareness of this, that it is not just um, up to the technology providers to fix this. It's actually people's behavior. It's the choices they make, as you said before, Karen. Um, I think there's also the vendors can make life easier um, in the technologies coming out of the box, being secure, um, not accepting defaults, default passwords, and some of those behaviors can be fixed. Um, we're seeing it with the, the combination of identity as well. So rather than every organization um, and every user interaction having its own unique identity being established, that there's a consolidation of identity around a number of providers. Um, and that federation of the system, I think, will help us make it more secure over time. But there is some personal responsibility there as well. So um, it, it's how do we engage the population? How do we engage the small businesses? Um, get them just enough information not to overwhelm them, but also to uh, provide them meaningful uh, mitigations for the typical threats that they they face and not every organization is going to be the same. Um, they'll all be quite unique, but there are some threats that are quite common across the entire ecosystem. Perhaps, John, I'll just say, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'd just three things I would say. First of all, uh, although I'm basically a person <laughs> in favor of startups and entrepreneurship, um, very big vendors spend a lot of money on security. So if your e e email is with a big vendor, your storage is with a big vendor, your ISP is a noted player, you've got some degree of confidence that the subcomponent parts, so you've got people looking after your security. Uh, the second thing I'd observe is uh, the Australian Cyber Security Centre or the Australian Signals Directorate uh, have done a lot of work recently, the uh, last you know, years on advice and the Queensland government does the same, advice to small business so if you were to go to cyber.gov.au, you'll see actually some advice to small business there. And then there are people like the, the Cyber Global Alliance, Cyber Global, Global Alliance, Global Cyber Alliance, sorry, Global Cyber Alliance, I think it is. They're actually out of New York, but they produce tools quite specifically for small business, which are freed, which also help them improve their cybersecurity. So there are a number of things you can, you can do, I think. I would like to jump in there as well and offer my perspective. I think often cases, small to medium organizations are ones where there's no one person who is the dedicated security manager or security director. It's usually either a shared responsibility of a few people or if it's a very small organization, the one person that's taking care of all of the IT and digital needs also has to take care of cybersecurity. So for an organization like that, that's really pressed for resources, I would recommend not just going for the government advice and here in Israel, the National Cyber Bureau also has advice and tools for small to medium organizations. I'd also recommend just like uh, Paul said, working with your ISP and with your technology vendors to make sure that you offload some of that security capability to a bigger fish that's going to help you be safer, but also spend time not just money or you know resources into technology but spend time if you can once a month once a quarter make it your security day 
go through things, review your systems, maybe spend some time attending a technical security conference, a hacker conference or a webinar to just update yourself. It doesn't take up a lot of money. Yes, it takes time, which is a valuable resource in of itself, but it's some of the ways to get the most bang for your buck is by just immersing yourself. If you're that director who's responsible for those security choices, just to immerse yourself for a day and a quarter or a day and a year in security knowledge so that you can bring that knowledge back to your organization and make everybody safer. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, we've got another question here. We've got about 10 minutes before we need to start wrapping up. So I think we can get some good coverage. Um, so we've got a question from Chloe. Um, and it speaks to something I think that both Karen and Rob have mentioned already, so we might take a, a little bit of a deeper look. Um, Chloe writes that she's interested in the comment on the role of risk from outside the technological realm. And, and as someone studying risk from a humanities perspective and applying sociological understandings to risk of, in information technologies, she's, she's interested to get a sense of uh, the opinions here in the panel on, on whether there is, well, I, I think the answer is yes, but what is the space for the humanities to make contributions to the industry? I love this question because not a lot of people know, but I also have a background in the humanities. So yes, I studied computer science and I've got technical certifications, but my first degree at Tel Aviv University, I studied computer science at another university prior to that, but my first degree at Tel Aviv University is actually from the humanities faculty. And it's a degree in the history and philosophy of science and technology. So I absolutely wanna resonate on this call today. The security industry needs people from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines, and that includes economics, it includes security studies, international relations, it includes psychology, it includes sociology, it includes so many different aspects. And even just to come to grips with the questions we discussed today, you know, public health decisions, these are policy decisions, not technology decisions, right? And coming, you know, coming up with models to evaluate the risk factors, coming up with ways to uh, suggest tools that people will actually embrace instead of revolt against. This is where we need people with humanities backgrounds, with social studies backgrounds. And I've got a lot of colleagues in the industry, security professionals in a variety of roles and companies that have that kind of background. So I wanna reiterate that to everybody on today's webinar. Cybersecurity is more than just programming or analyzing malware or you know, looking at code or looking at network packet captures. It requires a variety of different disciplines and there is not just space there's a need for people to bring in those different disciplines i can just to cap off that comment there's something called the economics of information security and that is a discipline in of itself which brings together people from economics from sociology and from technology and it's got conferences and papers and journals dedicated just to the economics of information security just to give you an example of one multidisciplinary field in this space thanks karen rob or paul yeah, totally agree, Karen. I think um, it has been left probably to technologists for way too long. Um, cybersecurity is a much broader problem than what technology can solve. Um, we talked about those behavioural aspects before. Um, there's economic aspects that you already called out. I, I think what we also have seen is um, the technology, there's an area of, of the business from a risk point of view that because quite often the behavior in, in cybersecurity incidents is to not talk about them and to minimize that, um, that collateral damage or, or um, ancillary damage about reputation and other things, there's this plausible deniability that one, it won't happen to me, and two, I'm not hearing about it enough um, for me to change my ways. So there's the whole behavioral aspect of organizations that if we don't get the right questions being asked by the right people in the organisation, um, the technologists can't answer all of those questions. And also, um, I think some of those things are well outside of where technology can um, engage in that piece. You know, there we see shadow IT as being an issue in a lot of organisations where the ability to buy it on a credit card um, might make it easy but there's some personal responsibility of the business line to actually make sure they understand the risk. You cannot, can't avoid all risk, but you can understand it and then minimize it to an appropriate level. Thanks, Rob. Um, 
Paul, anything you want to add? Or I've got a, got some more questions here from the from the audience. If we keep going with those, uh, okay, great. Um, so Ron asks a, a question. I think um, directed to Karen, but I'd be interested to hear Rob's and Paul's perspectives on this. Perhaps from the other side of the of the hacking fence. Um, if small time hackers do start doing this frontline work, how do they get the legitimacy to convince other people that the vulnerabilities they find are, are worth dealing with? And, and we might broaden that generally to the legitimacy of ethical hacking um, and, um, you know, where you see that in, in 2021, Karen. Fantastic question. So I can tell you, first of all, they are garnering more and more legitimacy and credibility for their reports. And in the past few years, it's become easier for a, what you call a small time hacker. It's become easier for an independent hacker to report a vulnerability, be acknowledged for their efforts, sometimes be remunerated for their efforts with money or with other prizes. And it's become a lot easier and more streamlined and straightforward than it was in the past. I can tell you that when I was growing up and I was hacking, if I found a vulnerability, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, usually my only recourse was to do something with it, to demonstrate a hack so that I would get people's attention or maybe leak it to the media. Both of these would be probably illegal, depending on the, you know, the circumstances and disruptive, you know, they would not be helpful behaviors so much, but I wouldn't really necessarily have a choice. Today, hackers do have a choice. And even for companies that don't have a public vulnerability disclosure program or a bug bounty program, there are ways to get in touch. And I've seen this happen all over the world. And in some cases, it's hard for those hackers, like you mentioned, Rowan, to get uh, credibility. So they need help from other hacker groups, hacker movements, and they come together in alliances, whether they are unofficial communities or groups or more official groups. In the past year, we've actually seen a group specifically looking at vulnerabilities in healthcare environments, and that was set up by volunteers just because of COVID-19. So a lot of hackers around the world decided they want to invest time and attention in finding vulnerabilities in healthcare systems so that they can help those healthcare providers stay safe during COVID-19. And they came together in something called the CTI, the Cyber Threat Intelligence League, a voluntary group of hackers that has now you know, thousands of representatives from all over the world. So the answer is there are legitimate ways to disclose vulnerabilities, whether via bug bounty programs or otherwise. And there are groups, movements, alliances, movements within the friendly hacker world so that they don't have to act alone. They can gather that credibility by working together with other hacker movements. Thanks, Karen. Um, Rob, perhaps from your perspective as, as the person who's responsible for the security of you know, some, some really important digital systems, um, how does it? How does how does the ethical hacking uh, community and bug bounties and so how does how does that look from from your side of the um, your side of the the digital wall? Yeah, look, and I think it for us it forms a part. At this point in time, we don't have formal um, bug bounty programs. However, we do have taken steps to strengthen the processes to make sure that reports of vulnerabilities and reports of bugs are recepted or are receipted by the organisation and actioned. And I think that's one of those first steps for a lot of organisations There quite often is a level of defensiveness, um, not because the organisation's risk adverse, it's because quite often the security practitioners or the, the infrastructure people who have to manage it are work adverse. They've already got enough on their plate. This is just something else, particularly if they don't understand what the business risk associated to that is. Um, if they've then got to go and find an owner in the business to take ownership of that, fund potentially the remediation work um, or the change necessary, quite often that's a load that already goes on top of a, of a uh, defender. Um, and that can be challenging for a lot of organisations. But I do think um, bug bounty programs do play a part going forward, particularly product-centric ones where... Um, Lots of things are depending on these products. They can all make um, a better understanding of the risks that we face as consumers of those products. Um, but we also want secure and reliable services for organisations um, being put out that we actually have trust in what's happening. And I think ma maintaining trust and confidence is really important. We'll never be 
um, vulnerability free or bug free. Um, it'll be an awful long time before we ever get to that situation, if at all. But we've actually got to be able to make sure that we've got that due diligence built into the system, um, that that immunity gets built up over time, that the fitness of these, um, these services is being challenged on a regular basis and that we've actually got ways of dealing with the outcomes of it rather than just um, saying that the, that the hackers are the, are the problem. No, it's actually the vulnerabilities in the first place of the problem. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Paul, a quick comment from you and then I've got one last question for each of you and then we'll wrap up. Uh, so, John, so John, I'll come back uh, with, a, with a challenge for you and, and your colleagues at universities and elsewhere. Uh, we've talked a lot about vulnerabilities here from software, but let me make an observation about network vulnerabilities, which tend to be amplifiers of, 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 of attacks. Uh, universities and, and TAFEs and, and high schools or whatever should have everybody leaving saying in their sleep, change default setting, change default setting, change default setting. The degree of vulnerability in the networks left because the equipment gets deployed with default settings is mind blowing. Yeah, and look, I would I would readily acknowledge the role of tertiary institutions and and others, not just tertiary actually, in making sure that um, basic security concepts are a fundamental part of a software engineering degree. For example, you know anyone learning learning web development needs to be learning about the vulnerabilities in, in parallel. So um, I think uh, I think the sector needs to take that one on board um, and see see that as part of our role. Um, look, we have. I, I had a wrap-up question, but actually, um, Ivano, who's one of my colleagues here at UQ, thanks, Ivano, for this question. I, I think it's a better one than I was going to finish with. Um, so it's a, it's quite forward-looking. So in a in a minute each, this is the challenge for for each of the panelists. So we can let people get away on time. In a minute each, what do you see as the three sure bets or best bets in terms of cybersecurity innovation in the next five years? What do you what do you see making a big impact? in the next five years. And I'll start with you, Karen. Thank you. So rapid fire round, three sure bets from my perspective. Number one, automation, more and more automation, machine learning in the defensive side, but also on the offensive side. We see criminals utilizing more automation in a variety of ways. So definitely something that's already happening, gonna happen even more on the defensive side, automation, that's number one. Number two is I think crowdsourced cybersecurity. The concept of bug bounty is one such element. I think we're gonna see more models to incentivize individuals to make better security decisions. And we're gonna see some security products and innovations around individual decisions, everyday behaviors to help people get safer. So that's number two. Number three is I'm very hopeful about, it's passwords and authentication and identity and changes fundamental changes in how we treat identity and maybe a move away from passwords into a passwordless future that uses different types of authentication mechanisms. And that's what I'm really hopeful about. Fantastic. Thanks, Karen. Um, Paul, your take. Three, three bets for the next five years. So Karen's very positive. I'm going to be the dark side of the force. Um, I'm going to take one of her innovations and add it to the thing that worries me a lot. Um, one of the things I'm very concerned about is, is, is uh, Internet of Things and SCADA systems being increasingly vulnerable to, to cyber attack um, and large scale. But what I worry about is, is the innovation of the criminals that Karen is referring to moving into that space and then posing risks that we've just, we've just seen in the last month, right? Somebody changing the settings inside a water plant in a small town in Florida, which they fortunately somebody found. What I worry about is A, the impact that has on real people. So several people asked, how do you make this real? That'll make it really real. The second thing worries me more about is that nation states cannot determine whether that was another nation state or whether that was a proxy or whether that was a criminal. And I think that's the stuff that is really dangerous when we come to state to state relationships. The criminals really could take us to a brink. All right, thanks, Paul. Robert, quick one from you, and then I'll have to wrap us up. Unfortunately, we could go for hours, I'm sure. Yeah, look, and and definitely, um, Karen and Paul touched on a couple of mine. I think that AI and automation piece um, both is a positive and a negative on both sides. I think we're going to see much more automation and um, artificial intelligence in the attackers as well as in the defenders. Um, I think the skills piece is making sure that we've actually got a supply chain 
of um, professionals to be able to address this and the shortage is going to be a big issue going forward. Um, and I think my third one was a toss up between addressing that economics of it. It's a bit lop lopsided at one side, but I think that my fourth, my, my third one really is around the need for multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, we touched on before where it's very much not just a technical problem. We need all sorts of disciplines to buy into the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And look, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you today. It was topical, it was engaging. There's there's a bunch of great questions that we didn't get to in the Q&A, so I'm sorry to the people who posed those. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to the University of Queensland, to the Embassy of Israel in Canberra, Tel Aviv University and the Blavatnik Inter Interdisciplinary Cyber Research Centre uh, for, for initiating and helping to support this. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the support and energy of Victoria Bick and, and Rachel Kelly, who were instrumental in getting today's event off the ground. Thanks both for your support. We couldn't have done it without you. And thanks, of course, to our guests who came along today to um, really are the reason that we're doing this. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, a final note, the video recording of this session will be available in the next few days and there'll be an email out to registration um, addresses when that's available. So that's all we have for tonight. Thanks very much, everybody, and um, have a good evening or rest of the day for our, um, for our colleagues elsewhere in the world. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Cheers.